All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for um, the sixth installment of our 2024 Water Watch Lecture Series. My name is Brian Taylor, and I work for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Uh, if you are not familiar with the NSRWA, we are a small local grassroots nonprofit, uh, which has a mission to preserve and protect uh, our most valuable natural resource that of course being water um, through uh, education, engagement, scientific monitoring and research programs. Uh, we strive to ensure healthy waters uh, for our South Shore communities, for the environment, habitat, uh, and of course the people. So um, the watershed has been around since 1970 and uh, we continue to work towards uh, our mission to this day uh, and for the future. So thanks so much for your support of um, educational programs like this. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to our sponsors uh, for their support of these programs. Uh, that of course is Clean Harbors, um, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Plymouth, and Duxbury. Thanks so much for uh, your continued support of these programs. I know Clean Harbors, as well as most of those uh, cultural councils, have supported uh, this Water Watch Lexus series year after year, and so we're very, very thankful of that. Um, so tonight, we have a, a great lineup, um, of course, and uh, uh, but uh, we also like to introduce uh, Kate Anderson with Mass Audubon, uh, who will be our Mass Audubon representative for tonight. So, Kate, if you want to say hello to the group. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Mass Audubon, and I work out of the North River Wildlife Sanctuary right in Marshfield. Um, so it's just amazing to be partnered with such a great organization, be associated with the fantastic work that you're doing. Um, and so just to be a part of this series. So I'll be sort of behind the scenes and hope to tell you a little bit about programs kind of at the end. But um, yeah, I'm still new with the organization. So it's, it's just amazing to be a part of the team uh, and it's wonderful to work aside, you know, great people. So excited for tonight's series. Thanks. Great, great. Thanks, Kate. Um, so tonight's program, um, there is uh, the, uh, if anyone has any questions, we'll try to save some time for questions at the very end. You are welcome to type in questions in the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and so uh, please feel free to do so um, at any point and we'll try to get to them at the end. If we don't have time for questions, we'll do like what we did uh, a couple weeks prior and that I can um, send any questions that go unanswered to the respective um, person that they might be pointed towards, and then we can um, uh, get some responses that we can send back out. So, um, and, and thanks, thanks all of you. Thanks again for joining. Um, so I'd like to introduce a few of our panelists tonight. Um, I'll start with Laura Ludrig. Uh, she is the, ed, uh, the director and founder of the Marine Debris and Plastics Program at the Center for Coastal Studies. Um, she focuses on interdisciplinary approach to investigate and respond to abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, um, beach debris, microplastics, and other marine plastic debris issues. Since its beginning in 2012, the primary focus of her program has been the removal of all those things in our waters um, in Cape Cod Bay. Um, and a recent federal grant from NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, the largest in CCS history, has enabled the removal and disposal efforts to expand into the entire Gulf of Maine. So Laura has directed at-sea fishing gear removal and recycling programs in Maine and Massachusetts since 2009. And she has also developed a 400 person volunteer beach brigade pretty impressive uh, size there which supports an active year-round shoreline cleanup and debris data collection effort on cape cod so uh, laura has presented presented her work um, at state regional and international conferences and the data generated by ccs marine debris and plastics program has supported local and state regional policy efforts surrounding plastic marine debris such as municipal single-use plastic bans statewide fishing gear debris protocols and federal environmental uh, impact assessments um, so uh, Laura, we're really excited to have you, and thanks so much for being here. We're also joined by Julia Kaplan. Um, Julia is an environmental analyst for the Division of Marine Fisheries, where she helps coordinate gear removal efforts during the fixed gear closure uh, that occurs from February 1st through May 15th. Um, and so both the closure and gear removal efforts are crucial in reducing entanglement risk to white right whales. Um, and Julia is currently finishing her master's degree in environmental science at UMass Boston. Uh, and during her studies, she wrote a white paper that analyzed uh, what 
policies and programs uh, different coastal states have in place to combat these issues of marine debris, uh, which we'll be learning about tonight. Uh, and then lastly, I'd like to introduce Pamela Moulton. Um, she is a prolific collaborator and both a teacher and artist. And Pamela works to foster an ethos of generosity and creative exchange through making art and collaborating with multi-generational communities, both near home and far away. Um, Pamela's installations are playful, large scale, hands-on and exploratory. Uh, Pamela uh, is a multidisciplinary environmental artist rooted in world building and collaboration. She recently collaborated with over uh, nearly 6,000 community partners, including lobstermen, neurodivergent patients, schools, artists, and many more in her Tempo Arts installation in Portland's Payson Park. Um, her interactive uh, spaces may be crawled through, climbed on, and occupied, which we will see some tonight, uh, along with public uh, uh, the, along with the public to explore its environmental consciousness and uh, in a direct and material way. Uh, and so uh, her energetic sculptures are woven um, and, and woven in environmental um, environments, I'm sorry, uh, are built from abandoned fishing equipment, which we will see uh, known to the industry as ghost gear, which is the focus of tonight's talk. Uh, and so Pamela's sculptures uh, are reminiscent of macro and microorganisms often gone unnoticed and unseen by the human eye. So the accessibility and joyous of her work lends itself to the greater consciousness about the fragility of our ecosystem and inspires better futures worth imagining. Um, and so we're really excited uh, for uh, to see Pamela's uh, work of art uh, tonight, as well as hearing um, from some of our, our, our panelists tonight about this issue that we are all so concerned about. So um, thanks so much to the three of you for joining us tonight. Um, and I know that we are also joined by a local fisherman, um, Eric Lorenzen, who will also have the opportunity to speak tonight and answer some questions. So, um, but um, Julia, I will let you go ahead and kick us off tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we're really excited for our, our presentation tonight. Well, first, um, can you see the picture I'm sharing? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Kaplan, and um, thank you for the introduction, Brian. So I don't really have many visuals, but I'm hoping this picture will um, explain itself as I talk through some of what um, I'm giving a, a background um, tonight on DMFs. Um, I'm just trying to see. You can still see the picture, right? I just have a couple notes up, but you're seeing the yep. picture. Yep, okay, we, we can see Julie. Yep. Okay. I uh, just wanted to make sure. So um, I'm here to give a brief background on what the state of Massachusetts is doing in regards to ghost gear and um, gear that was swept away during storms. And so I will just dive right in and um, give you some background. So in order to protect the endangered North Atlantic right whale from becoming entangled in trap gear, which when I reference trap gear, it's a trap and usually there's a buoy line attached to it with a buoy at the surface that the fishermen then retrieves. And so um, Massachusetts instituted a commercial trap gear closure in state waters from February 1st through May 15th. Um, and this closure extends from Cape Cod Bay all the way to the New Hampshire border, as well as state waters east of Cape Cod, which extends out three miles. Um, that's kind of the state waters boundary. And then it turns to federal waters. And so to ensure the efficacy of this trap gear closure in state waters, DMF, which is um, short for Division of Marine Fisheries, who I work for, partnered with the Massachusetts Environmental Police to remove trap gear left during the months of February and March. Um, and so the closure starts February 1st. So we typically use planes and they'll fly over and mark any buoyed gear that's left on the surface. And that will be put into a map. And those maps will be sent to us at DMF and we'll work with um, contracted commercial fishermen so we contract about six fishermen each season. Um, and Eric Lorenzen, who is on tonight, is one of those commercial fishers who does the work for us. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. And so um, these contracted fishers 
provide the vessel and the expertise necessary to safely and efficiently haul and transport the gear retrieved back to port. And so DMF works with different dock managers to ensure that we can store the gear that we retrieve temporarily until the owner can come and pick it up. Usually it is identifiable um, if it's commercial and it has a trap tag, but um, now that we are in the third year of this program, we're seeing less and less gear. So I'll back up a bit to 2022 uh, was February 2022 was the first year that we implemented the removal efforts, boots on the ground, retrieving gear. And um, we retrieved a bit over 2000 traps and 500 buoy lines, which was an anomaly because it was the first year we were doing it. We had never ran a gear removal program before. And so a lot of the stuff we were hauling up was there for years and, you know, it got swept away in storms and, you know, we, we were retrieving stuff with buoys from 2017, 2018, which was pretty surprising because we would think at that point the buoy would break off or something. But um, now that that stuff is all cleaned up, this past year, we retrieved way less. Um, I don't even, the numbers weren't really even that significant. Um, and then this year, Eric can speak to the number of days that he had, but I think the first year he had about 10 days. Last year, he had about five days going out and retrieving gear for us. And this year, I think it's only been three days. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's coming up now is recreational gear. There are a lot of recreational fishermen who will, you know, accidentally leave their stuff out or they don't retrieve all their traps because they don't remember where they left it. And each recreational fisherman is allowed to have 10 traps. Um, so as far as funding goes, um, 2022 DMF relied on a one-time supplemental funding source to run the program. And so we didn't really have a long-term funding source and that's kind of where my white paper came in. I can share the link to my paper um, once I'm done talking. Um, and it kind of, that's, I, I examined what other states do for their abandoned gear programs. And I came back to DMF with a summary, AKA my white paper, showing what each coastal state does, what their regulations are. Um, and I kind of created recommendations on how DMF can improve our regulations because when we ran the program the first year and came in with over 2000 traps, we ran into the issue of storage. We had nowhere to, we did have, dock space that we had coordinated but we weren't expecting to have that much gear now we don't so it's not as big of a pressing problem but in 2022 it was a pressing problem and um we were able to like the i'll back up so trap gear is personal property so that's where we were running into the problem because everything that we retrieved belong to someone despite it being in a closed area and illegally kept basically in that closed area. So regardless that it was kept there illegally, we had to return it to its rightful owner. And doing that with 2000 traps proved to be very time consuming and an administrative burden. And our laws, it's chapter 130, section 31 and 32 for anybody who is um, has a policy background and would like to look into this on their own, those laws um, under Section 31 and 32 had not been updated since, 19, since the 1940s. And they were written back when lobstermen were using wooden traps that check, would break down over time. Um, and obviously things have changed now. And so um, even gear that had washed up on shore you know, that is considered personal property. So even somebody walking along the beach who sees a trap that's washed up, they technically cannot touch it and cannot dispose of it. So from this white paper that I wrote, highlighting all of these issues, DMF created a task force that contained industry members, um, along with myself, 
And we worked, we had several meetings, um, working meetings to come up with strike through regulatory language that we could send to legislature to get these statutes changed um, so that, you know, the, the traps are still people's personal property, but um, when it comes to being found illegally in an closed area, then we have the right to discard it, recycle it. Um, you know, we we still obviously make an effort to return it to its owner if it's identifiable. But the fact of the matter is, now that we're three years into this program, a lot of the stuff we're pulling up is not identifiable, and we would be stuck with it ultimately. We can't throw it out. So now, um, from this task force, we sent a another white paper. <laughs> to uh, the legislature and the Coastal Caucus um, to kind of plead our case and highlight the issues that we're facing running this abandoned gear program. And um, we were able to get their support and they actually sent us some draft um, statutory language a couple of weeks ago. So it's it's in the works and our, our laws are going to change to make it so that we can dispose of and recycle gear when it is found illegally. Um, so we're slowly taking on the issue, but that's a high level view of, of what we're doing um, at the state level to combat this issue. And this picture is um, Eric and his crew doing the retrieval efforts um, in 2022. And this obviously was a ball of gear that was pulled up and um, you know, the environmental police shadow us there in the background there. So they shadow us um, just so they're aware of what's going on. They know who's out there because it is, we do retrieve gear during a closure. So to some onlookers, it could look like we're actively fishing, but that's not the case. Um, so I will stop there. I Eric will be available at the end. I think we're doing questions at the end. Um, so I will pass it on to Laura Ludwig from Coastal Studies, Center for Coastal Studies, and she can talk about her work. Um, and I will gladly take any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Julia. And it's a great preparation. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here <clears throat> for the talk that I'm about to give um, regarding um, ghost gear in Massachusetts. Um, thank you all for attending and uh, taking some time out of your busy days to, to learn more about ghost gear. And thank you to Brian and company for organizing this, this great presentation. Um, I've been working with Ghost Gear for about 20 years uh, in Maine and Massachusetts. I am the director, as, as Brian mentioned, I, I started a program at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown <clears throat> quite a while ago. And um, I have to see how to advance these things here. Here we go. And and to give you a little context, um, Ghost Gear is the underpinning of my my program, um, Ghost Gear Removal and Handling Ghost Gear. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. But I also have, um, as Brian mentioned, a, a formidable group of people who volunteer to help clean up the shoreline, uh, help collect the data, and also um, use the materials that we uh, find from beaches and shorelines and and the underwater world uh, in an upcycled way. So I'd like to uh, give a hat tip to my father because when I was a tiny little child, this is what he would often be doing. So I'm hoping some of you are laughing because this is a 40 year old photo or two of my dad on an island <clears throat> in Muscungus Bay, um, sorting derelict rope. So uh, he has always done that. And these are some of his lures that he's found in Rhode Island. And uh, as I often, and want to say this nut didn't fall far from that tree. And that's me. Um, my program is really about um, ghost gear. And I've been working with the commercial fleet in Maine and Massachusetts for a long time now. And I was a commercial fisherman in Maine. And we conducted um, a lot of work on uh, gear modifications and um, fishing technologies and uh, techniques that might mitigate the um, entanglement issue for whales during all of these efforts. And it, the, the focus in Cape Cod Bay is to really work with the commercial fleet to identify locations where this gear may be located um, and remove it and handle it properly. I work 
hand in hand with the Division of Marine Fisheries on this work because um, authorization is required to handle someone else's fishing gear, as Julia was just mentioning. Um, and it's really important to me to do this um, in a way that's understood and, um, and, and understood to be an assistance for the fishery. I want to make a very um, uh, clear note that ghost gear is abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. That's kind of the definition of it. Um, it, it is um, fishing gear that is beyond the control of the person who set the gear, essentially. Whether they threw it there, whether they lost it, whether it was cut off, whether um, you know it has been abandoned over time. Um, however it got there, it's no longer under the control of the person who set it. And it can pertain to trap fishery, uh, which is, uh, or a pot fishery, which is the, vis the uh, visual heater, or, or um, mobile fleet fisheries or net fisheries. Any fishing gear can uh, become what's known as ghost gear. And to get it out of the water, we have to really um, go through a few basic steps so that we're not uh, needling in a haystack. So I, I've listed them here um, and quickly, it's just basically connecting with all of the stakeholders, including waste handlers and fishermen, and then uh, collecting a lot of data as we go through it. Um, and we'll be talking a little more about that. The primary areas that I've been working um, have been in Cape Cod Bay uh, with this program for the past 10 years. We have done a little bit of removal work off of Stellwagen Bank, which is at the Northern part of your screen there. And, uh, and we really focus on areas that we've been pointed to by industry. So I do a lot of communication with fishermen before we even go out there. Once we get input from fishermen, we run a few side scan sonars, um, so, sorry, side scan sonar surveys. And we, uh, in, especially in areas where we have not been before so that we can identify what the bottom type is, what we're up against and what this gear might look like on the bottom. The Center for Coastal Studies has a very good mapping um, program, a ge uh, marine geology mapping program, and they work with me very closely to generate these data. And that helps us really focus on the areas where we find um, lost gear. Uh, the, the tools that we use are typically grapple uh, grappling lines, and that is uh, pictured on the top left there, is a typical grapple that might be used by, by a commercial lobsterman to recover gear uh, once they've lost it, which, by the way, many fishermen do. Most fishermen, in fact, if they lose their gear and they have any inkling where it might be, they will try to get it back. But sometimes they don't know where it is because um, it's been towed off by a sailboat or a tug or a barge or, um, frankly, a whale. Um, and another point I really want to highlight here is that the whale entanglement issue, which is a huge um, issue, by the way, is primarily an active fishing gear issue. There have been very, very little data that point to ghost gear as being impl implicated in whale entanglements. It seems sort of strange, but but people look at that gear off of, that comes off of whales very carefully. Um, professional people, fishermen who know what they're looking at and uh, managers and, and researchers. And it's really not demonstrating that the gear once um, it's been analyzed was was derelict when the whale encountered it, and more typically, the the buoy lines are implicated in these in these entanglements. So the gear that we're getting off the bottom is uh, really just getting a lot of plastic out of the ocean and some entrapment and entanglement risk for perhaps other smaller animals. And you can see here that there is a lot of it. We remove trap gear, we remove net gear, we remove rope. Now. Keep in mind, Julia was just mentioning that they do a removal program in Massachusetts waters during closure. All of our removal work in Massachusetts must take place during that closed area and closed time. It is virtually impossible to remove ghost gear where active gear is also being fished. So we do not do any of this work outside of the closure period in Massachusetts. Um, and so that the, the material that we're finding has no buoys on it. We are using sonar imagery and anecdotal information from fishermen to locate this, this material. And we locate a lot of it. 
Once we've gotten it, we bring it back to shore and it can consist of traps and rope and nets and lines and steel cable, which is featured in the center of this image. Um, and then it all has to be handled by people on the dock to put it into a proper um, situation so that it can be either disposed of or recycled. The work that we've been doing recently in Provincetown, and many of you will recognize that characteristic curl at the tip of the cape there, um, those squiggly colored lines are one of my commercial uh, partners, the Miss Lily, who fishes out of Provincetown. And he was grappling in that area during 2017 over and over and over and over and has done so in 2018, 19, we skipped 20, 21, 22, and 23 in that same exact area, which if I had a little pointer, um, I could correlate, <laughs> sorry about that, in the top uh, right map to the tip of Provincetown on Long Point, between, basically between Long Point and Wood End. Now, why is that? We, we've, we've done a lot of uh, data documentation and we found that a lot of the debris that we get out of those areas is actually debris that's been brought in by uh, the mobile fishing fleet who are fishing in other areas and coming in and as a result of the regulations, having to dump gear that does not belong to them. Gear that they have um, pulled up inadvertently in the course of harvesting the fish that they're targeting. In this case, um, uh, we worked uh, with the Division of Marine Fisheries to permit this ground fish vessel to go out and not dump what they typically would dump, but to bring it back to shore. And this was a way of gathering data about the type of material that other fisheries are encountering in the course of their harvesting. And then because of the laws, dumping it elsewhere, getting it out of the way so that it doesn't impact their fishing the next time. The location where a lot of this dragged gear was removed, this was in 2021, was this red uh, point here, somewhat offshore of the Peaked Hills off of Truro. And that, that was one vessel that brought in all of that material. And when you uh, take all the data, as we do with all of our removals, and you, you record everything, um, you get quite a few numbers. And if you look at the end of the top great great graph there, you'll see in uh, the totals, we've, we've, we've brought in nearly 80 tons of debris over those past, there were only eight seasons that we were working over the past 10 years. And then in particular, the dragger bringing in just these random things, hagfish barrels, which is a fishery that is unregulated in this country. It is an offshore fishery that people just, you know, this is, this is what those barrels are. Um, these red barrels on the right with, with black uh, trap heads in them. It, it's a global fishery, but it's not really paid attention to here in North America. And yet these draggers are bringing in barrels all the time. So point being, data is really important. <laughs> and we do have a lot of data points. We've, we've side scan surveyed over 40 miles in Cape Cod Bay over the past 10 years, recovered over 1,700 lobster traps, of which about half were reclaimed by fishermen who owned them, the rest were basically junk, and then uh, many tons of other debris. I've worked with uh, dozens and dozens of commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen as well, shellfish fishermen included. And then all of this material um, has been processed in a way that we're able to either return it to the owner, upcycle it, recycle it, or incinerate it. And then the data um, has, has really contributed to the report that um, that Julia referred to, and I was met, I was part of this task force where we were able to say, you know, a lot of the material that we're finding is recreational lobster fishing gear, which is basically the result of people not really knowing what to do with their material at the end of their summer season and just leaving it there. So a lot of these regulations will be um, hopefully modified in a way that will allow anyone to come across a pile of gear such as featured on the cover of the task task force report um, and and dispose of it in their own way because it is clearly debris. Um, ghost gear does not only exist in underwater, it also washes up on shore. And I wanted to mention this because um, I was asked to do some removal work on the island of Cuddyhunk, which is the southernmost island in the Elizabeth Island chain, which comes out of basically New Bedford and extends toward Block Island in Buzzards Bay and um, 
Nantucket Sound. And I, I was able to get some funding through uh, the EPA, the Southern Region, to go out and address as, uh, a pile or two of fishing gear that had washed up on the shores of this tiny little island. The islanders were uh, just overwhelmed. They had no idea what to do with all of the material. On the left, you see one of my volunteer artists who is collecting debris to be disposed of, but also which may be used in artwork on Cuddy Hunk. And then on the right, you see the um, Massachusetts Environmental Police um, um, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, I can't remember what his title. Yeah. Major. Yeah, Lieutenant sorry. Colonel. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel. Colonel. Yep. Yes. Um, who championed this effort? He was. He spun us out there to get a look at it because you know it's impossible for enforcement to deal with this, and they were getting phone calls all the time from people on the island. What can you do? This lobster gear is just piling up. So I went out there with uh, 24 volunteers. We found 24 gloves or more, plus a whole bunch of lobster gear, and we took it all apart. There's one of my volunteers um, just standing in the middle of that pile there on the right that we had exploded and, and spread out so we could deal with it. Um, that was just one of many piles that we dealt with. And then we had to move all of those debris items over land to a centralized area for it to come off of the island. And the reason I'm talking about this is because it's a really tough waste stream to deal with. It's not easy for people to deal with this on a regular basis. It requires concerted effort. And as a result of our week-long effort there, we removed nearly just about eight tons. It was 15,960 or something pounds of debris that included the wire traps um, as well as um, a lot of other things. And I've listed basically the top 10 on the right-hand side here. And if you look um, at some of these, you'll see um, that they are also consistent um, with debris that is generated by the fishing industry. Uh, the rest of it is generated by the rest of us. So we're all complicit in um, debris on shorelines. Um, my beach brigade, I, I just named it the beach brigade because we just kept growing in forces. We just kept tackling this problem. And we, we do what I call adventure cleanups. Um, this is just, we've been doing them for 10 years. We go out, we spend days at a time removing debris items, small and large, uh, from Cape Cod National Seashore, as well as other areas around Massachusetts, depending on where the focus, I, focus area might be. Um, we do them in all all seasons. We collect all sorts of debris items, including things that have eroded uh, off of the cliffs in Truro and elsewhere during um, coastal erosion events. Um, the the volunteers are hardy. They are they are somehow always smiling, and they come out in the ho most horrible of weather. And we collect tons and tons of debris off of shorelines. Um, the most recent cleanup, I wasn't able to be there, and my my uh, trusty uh, helpers, Sarah on the right and Fritz on the far left, um, were able to convene 15 people or so to go out in bitter cold last week. Um, I'm in Arizona. It's about 60 degrees, so these guys really did me a real favor. They also did the beach a real favor. Um, the debris is all sorted and counted. We tally it on data sheets uh, back at our centralized location, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Um, and the reason we do it this way is because counting this type of material while you're outdoors trying to clean it um, is sort of a fool's errand on a windy day. So we wait, we, we either bring it indoors, and I hope this video will play for you. Um, and we basically dump the bag out and we um, sort everything, whatever it is. In this case, this was one of, I think, 32 trash bags of debris that we had collected on the outer shore. Um, each bag takes around an hour to sort through. You can see the small bugs <laughs> crawling around. Um, we, we try to free all of the living creatures in our organic material. Um, but this is another way of demonstrating that when one cleans the beach and uses weight as a metric, you're often weighing uh, sand, rocks, seaweed, hay, bugs, tree roots, branches, and other organics that might come up in the course of trying to clean the beach. So this way we get a, a much cleaner um, debris count and we are able to also weigh the uh, discrete items afterward. Um, not everybody does it this way, I understand, and not all of our, our cleanup efforts 
uh, include this type of, you know, very detailed um, counting, but most of them do, and it yields a great amount of uh, d data. In 2023, we removed a total of 75,000 plus items from the shoreline in I think about 14 cleanups. Um, those are the top 10 that are listed there. And again, um, I just wanted to highlight since this is a, a, fish, a ghost gear um, uh, talk, uh, the fishing gear that, that usually finds its way into the top 10, along with bottle caps and foam and other um, consumer debris items. This year I created uh, with the help of some great partners, um, a field guide to the marine debris in the Gulf of Maine. And a lot of that uh, is, a lot of these items are highlighted in that um, publication. And you're welcome to let me know if you would like a copy of that. It's available online. Um, data is really important because it can help solve mysteries. We started picking this, this yellow stuff up in 2021, I believe, and we didn't know what it was. And maybe some of you on this uh, have heard this before, uh, some of you in the audience here. But it, for those of you who don't, it was a mystery for about six months. We, did, we collected it. We had never seen it before. We collected it in every single cleanup, and it showed up in every size imaginable from one quarter inch to 90 feet long. Um, we found it in the rack line, in the grass, in the sand. We just kept coming up and we didn't know what it was. It's not weed whacker string, um, which is what most people uh, say at the, at the outset. Um, I did a little research and found out that, I did a lot of research actually, and found out that it came from the blasting project in the Boston Harbor area when they were blasting bedrock. And so I wound up having a, multi-year conversation with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it just highlights the importance of data as a result of collecting data through a citizen science um, collection effort through this portal called the ANIC Data Portal. We were able to collect information about um, this material that had been was being found everywhere. Um, we got over 1,800 feet um, logged in this portal um, and a uh, the conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers continue as we try to, and they are changing their protocols as a result, because this material was not supposed to escape. And, and for those who don't know, it was used to blast the bedrock. So the detonation fuse, the fuse is lit at the surface. It travels down this hollow tube to the, to the base where it's been set and it explodes the bedrock. And it's at that point that some of this material is loosed into the environment. So I just like to highlight the data collection as really part and parcel with all of the removals. But then you're left with the stuff. What do you do with the stuff after you've, you've collected it, you've cleaned it out of the ocean, you put it up, brought it to your backyard or wherever you have it, and it just sits there. And you're like, what do I do with all this stuff? Well, I can assure you that some artists um, that I work with would look at this photo and say, can I have that stuff? But um, I have worked with many artists over the past 10 to 12 years, repurposing debris, uh, material that is uh, used in the fishing industry, particularly uh, that would be retired or thrown out otherwise. One artist named Orly Genger uh, received over 300,000 pounds of rope from me that I sourced from commercial fishermen. And she then made this and other things. And she has, she created these massive sculptures, not as a way of highlighting end of life lobster gear, but just simply because it was beautiful. And that was her medium. Other, other things that she made, they weren't all red, but I happen to just feature the red color here. They're all painted. She could paint them any color she wanted. So this material, even once a fisherman has retired it or it's been recovered from a ghost gear project, it can be very valuable. And I'm going to highlight a few of my key artists here that I've worked with. This is Jen Stone in Harwich, and she really likes this and, and other artists also uh, like this material that's not green and shiny. The green and shiny stuff is hard to paint, hard to work with. It's plastic. It's it's. Um, it's basically uh, polypropylene or polyethylene, whereas the other stuff is nylon, and it's really nice to work with. Um, we've got some partners in the world now who recycle all of this stuff, but I try to get it in the hands of an artist first because guess what they do with it? They give it some more value. So this is all long line that was, and um, and also um, 
the long line is on the left and this uh, agate figure on the right was made with um, the net that you see here that she has unknotted, taken the knots out and then dyed and made into these beautiful things. And then here are some other um, types of things that have been repurposed by artists. Um, all of that net was was strung up this way to provide a backdrop for a multimedia presentation on Martha's Vineyard and that then went on to three or four different locations um, by Annie Lewandowski at Cornell University. These artists are in Boston and I believe um, Orleans or Hyannis and they come by and they shop at my Marine Debris Mall and they go home and they make these spectacular things that are just total art. And, um, and they display them at various galleries and studios and have lots of great response. Um, here's an artist uh, from Long Island who comes to Cape Cod to take debris so that she could create something that was commissioned actually by the National Park Service and by the Center for Coastal Studies called Mama Shug. This is AKA um, um, Sugar. Her name is Sugar, aka Mama Shug. And she is built from marine debris that was collected from the Cape Cod National Seashore. And she is displayed there to this very day and will be there for several years. So come on by and see a life size white shark made from plastic trash. Um, and, and a remarkable artist in our midst is a woman named Pamela Moulton, who works with large scale. Uh, cast off fishing gear and she's constantly in touch with us about what types of net she might need or rope that might be great and we try to find it for her and my partners in Maine at the Buffalo Maine Lobster Foundation um, and I were able to point them point her in this direction so that she could create oh, just a few small things but I'll let her tell you about that when we get there um, and you'll hear from her in a moment. Coming up I'll be partnering with um, some folks in New England because we're expanding beyond the Cape Cod Bay area. Um, maybe you've uh, heard of Blue Ocean Society. Uh, that's in Portsmouth. You've heard of Oceans Wide. They're based in Maine. The Rosalia Project is, um, they run a uh, research uh, sail, sailing vessel in, in Maine in the summers and they clean islands um, of fishing gear. Um, Net Your Problem recycles fishing gear. And I'm very happy that they have set up shop here uh, after being active on the Alaska coast for several years. And my uh, good partners at the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation are very key to this um, collaboration. It is a regional collaboration that will span from Provincetown all the way to the down east Maine islands. And the five or six of us uh, organizations will be doing what we do in these areas where we will be removing and collecting data on ghost gear off of islands, shorelines, and underwater. And speaking of islands, the last thing that I'm gonna mention is that I'll be working off of the Boston Harbor coastline um, in the fall of this year, uh, working very closely with the DCR and the National Park there uh, to be, and they, they have come to me to, to say, you know, we have this issue. It's really tough to remove this stuff. Um, how can we get out there? What can we do? And the collaboration has begun. And it, um, this is Jorge Ayub on the right. And he gave me a tour of these islands. And I thought, you know, if we can do Karihunk, we can do this. I'll be looking for volunteers for this adventure cleanup. And that will be in September. Um, and also we'll be targeting a shoreline around the same time. I think if you look through on the right photo, you can see the Boston shoreline. This is a photo that I took last fall, last summer in Hull, um, where it is a very rocky shoreline that just collects um, debris during storm items. And it's primarily fishing gear and lobster traps that have come in from God knows where. Maybe, maybe Eric on the call can help us figure out where all this stuff is coming from, but that will be a targeted area for a cleanup. I, I collaborate uh, with everyone. If you would like to collaborate, please reach out to me. A collaboration is the way to get things done, but I really appreciate the support from these particular institutions. And I also want to acknowledge that all of our work takes place in the ancestral homeland of many Native folks. Um, and being out here in Arizona brings that very uh, brightly to mind uh, today. So thank you for your attention. Sorry to have been so, so long-winded, but it's a lot to cram in. And I want to uh, pass the baton here to Pamela, who has been a great collaborator and an, an, is an amazing artist. So I'll stop sharing so that you can meet Pamela. Um, yes, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Laura. Um, your collaboration has been incredible to me. Um, thank you so much. So I'm based in Maine and 
I am actually, um, I grew up in Maine, but then after high school, I moved, uh, I moved far away and I've been living abroad for a long time. I lived in Europe for about 30 years and I really was more of a fiber artist and I collected things. And I moved back to this country, back to Maine when my son was a freshman and here we go. And I was instantly drawn to working with this material and actually the material found me. Um, this piece that you're looking at right here is, um, it's, we, we now call it the pinkies because it's an easier, it was called Beneath the Forest, Beneath the Sea. And it's um, it's in Payson Park and it's there. Um, this was a project where I collaborated with so many different people and it's made with um, all ghost gear supplied by Laura, uh, Laura's organization and the Gulf of Maine um, Lobster Foundation. And it was, really interesting to learn how, I guess this is the second time I'd worked with this material, but I had to learn about how to take this material apart. Cause when I work with something, I'm like, ah, how can I transform this? So it's, it, you won't really recognize it at first. So it's, um, it's a really long process cause it's the cleaning and the dissecting and I unravel all the ropes and I, and I try to think about, um, how I can, I also, um, like this work of art specifically was, uh, I worked with many schools and I'm like, okay, this is so perfect because this kind of work really opens dialogues with the community about this, about, you know, our environment on many levels, yet it has this sort of joyful, uh, playful feeling. And so it really worked and it's so heartwarming because when I go to these sculptures, the, the, if the children are there, they are, they're like my little ambassadors and they talk about ghost gear and they talked about, you know, how much it weighed. And um, so that was a great project. Do you want to go on to the next slide? See what's... Yep. Yep. Hold on. I, yeah. I, it, it looks like it got a little out of order, Pamela. I'm sorry. I, I know you had an just, order. Just, it doesn't matter. Just play and I'll just jump. Let's see. Because it, did it, st can you see the advanced one? Nope. All right. All right. All right. We had this, we had this working when I practiced. I'm sorry, Pamela. <laughs> you can see where I'm sitting. Actually, this is a piece right here that was, um, it was in the biennial at the Rockland, the Center for Mining Contemporary Art. And this is, it's still decorated for Christmas and Valentine's Day, but this was um, to, like knotted up pieces of rope. You could see that, um, I'll show you like, these are pieces of like, this is rope that's been unraveled. And um, it's very, it's a very time consuming process what I do. Oh, here we go. Now we have a new slide. So this shows the last, this is, um, these are the pinkies before they turn pink. And this is one of the high schools that helped me. And you can see how I, I take a lot of that net and it's, um, it's, since I'm a fiber artist, it's all sewn. So I learned a lot of the fishermen um, are my friends I actually taught taught a couple of the fishermen in Portland swimming when they were little, when they were young. So they've been teaching me all these special knots and, um, and, and then I teach my students. So this, we, we sew all these sculptures together with these different stitches. And then um, the, he's just having some fun there, but you can advance it. I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, Pamela, this is, it's for whatever reason. Okay, okay. Okay. So as I work, like I, so every, every material, every fishing, you know, this ghost gear that I find, it's like, it's a challenge. I'm like, okay, this material, you know, I know how to work with it. And I could not figure out how to work with um, the float rope, the fisherman's float rope, because it was a material that doesn't accept the paint that well. And it couldn't go outside because it breaks down in the sun. And since I'm very environmentally conscious, I didn't want to do anything that was bad for the environment. So I, I discovered that I could unravel. I was very exciting. I could unravel this float rope. And the orange one that you see, for example, this, the very bottom of that orange sculpture is line that was tested for the right whale. Like it had to break at a certain strength. So I collected all of that from one organization. And, and then 
as I unravel, I noticed on the ground that there were like, like little shreds of, of the rope and plastic. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't want this like plastic trash on the ground. What am I going to do with this now? I've created a monster. So then I, I was cleaning it all up and I realized that you can actually take it and mold it and you can look at these um, these sculptures and see their shapes on them. So I actually can mold this these scraps of float rope. And these may just look like sculptures, but they actually are part of a, um, a superhero environmental team. And they're part of a performance. They can be worn, they're worn on your head. And each one, like the, the pink one, is a magnet for invasive species. So that, you know, that's each one of them has sort of a purpose. The um the one on the orange one has little magnifying like lenses. And so that's like to filter the water. And this next one with a um with the test tubes on top is called Zostera for eelgrass. And she's sort of the leader of this little group. And she is trying, and so anyway, I'm creating this whole fantasy. Um, about saving the um, bioregion in Portland, Maine, and Casco Bay, and the seagrass meadows. So these sculptures are actually uh, amphibious, and you can wear these pieces in the water. So it's for performance on land that goes into the water. Next slide, please. Oh, it's tricky. Uh, it's, it, yeah, I'm sorry. It, it keeps kicking me out. Um, but we'll, all right, okay. Oh, this was a fun one. This was this was crazy. When Laura was showing you that picture with all of the net on that big truck, I um I I had been there was a big, I guess a big gear drop in Portland. And I just all this gear was just like, wow, what? This is such a treasure trove of materials. And at that very moment, I had a phone call from a museum uh, that does these immersive environment um, immersive experiences around saving the environment. And they said, we'd like you to commission you to do a piece using like fishing gear uh, about ghost gear or about, and, um, and um, I couldn't believe it because I was standing right down at the dock where all of this material was. And this actually is made of teeny tiny pieces of, I mean, they're, so it was a half a mile net that I cut into tiny, tiny segments. And then each one was unraveled and tied onto the piece. And um, I sent this, to the museum and they said oh no it's it's they they said we think it's too beautiful looking like this because the people could get inside of it so they turned they turned everything red like everything had to be painted red i think i have another picture somewhere we'll come to where you'll see the installation but it had sound and it has um how do you say that when you put you can hold your phone up and you can see fish swimming around and anyway it's in toronto now oh this is these are the rubber cookies. And this, I'm actually, this I'm gonna work on uh, this summer. This is just playing around. I wanted to I wanted to see what I could do with the, these are the rubber cookies that are on the bottoms of these big trot, like ground trawling nets. And when I get the nets, sometimes they, they're so heavy and unruly. And I had to go out and buy all these tools to like cut them apart and dissect all the different parts. But I love the rubber cookies. So I'm actually gonna try to build um, some outdoor sculpture with these. And I just wanted to see how this white drawing on them with a special um, tool, how it would hold up in the weather. In the weather, So this was a test and it's been outside um, as an experiment. Next one. Oh, so this is working great, Brian. I, I, I finally got, I think I finally got it. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me, Pamela. <laughs> and this is at, um, I had a studio in Brunswick and this was just, we were bringing these pieces um, because I build the pieces not knowing what I'm going to do with them. And then I assemble them, sort of play around. It's very intuitive. I don't really have a plan of what I'm going to make. I have a general, I have the structure, but then I sort of just play around with the materials with my insistence and we um, come up with things. This is, so it's basically these little net packages that we've sewn together with different kinds of net painted. And it's pink. You can go on to the next one. Um, and the reason everything is pink, yes, yeah, some some of my volunteers did that for me. I never wound up using that, but I I liked I liked it. You can go on. So um, yeah, and here the balls are. This is one of my assistants, and we were uh, attaching those to the structure and sewing them all together. Um, but when this when this we decided to go for pink because 
I, people don't really think of pink as the color for climate change, but it actually is. Uh, when you think about the Arctic and that there's this fungus that's growing, it's like a pink fungus or, that's causing the snow to melt more quickly. And in the ocean, there are the, the algae blooms that have sort of this pinkish red color. So in these lakes um, that are like bubblegum pink that so pink was sort of like a color that was a double edged sword. It was it was joyful, but it, hmm, it's like not so great. The next one. Oh, and that's just a rope, one of my excursions looking for materials. <laughs> I get it. So I get messages on my phone from all these fishermen with ferry boat lines and piles of rope and hey, could you use this? So it's really, it's, um, so this is a fun adventure, but next, next one. This is the piece behind me. And this, these are some of the students that had worked with me. And, and I told them at the museum, I'm like, tell the curator that you're allowed to touch that work of art. <laughs> so they did. Next one. That was just the net. You've seen that picture. That was Mother's Day, actually. That was like the best Mother's Day ever. <laughs> Next slide. I think that's for the photos. That's, that's what I have. Here. Yeah, so that's great. So um, like right now, I'm working on a project for the University of uh, Southern Maine. Uh, and it's it's another like large sculpture. And they, the pieces are sort of, they're all built from with a metal base. And then there's sheaths with this like rope and netting. And I try, I want them to look like they're sort of like creatures emerging from the ground and that are a little bit like Dr. Seuss or a little bit like some weird plant that's growing, but really, so you, you, you want to approach them and like, like, what is this material? What is this made out of? And you want to, and you really want to touch them and, and, and you can um, walk beneath the sculptures and it's just, um, yeah, I mean, and I'm still, I'm still learning and still exploring, but I, this, this, uh, that's why the rubber cookies are the late, the, my next challenge, like figure out how to work with those. But I'm just loving like, all the materials that I'm receiving from Laura and the other organizations. I'm like, just my, um, I don't, there weren't any studio pictures there. I wish my studio was filled with nets and um, my garden shed is my rope shed now. Um, let's see if so I can, I, let me see if I can cue one of those up. And then I've got your video too, Pamela, that oh, I can play. Can, yeah. And let me just, the video that Ryan's going to show you just shows you how much time I spend with each little piece of net. Um, and, I, and I, it's just a one, like just a one minute video, but it shows the, like, I, I, I calculate that I spend about seven minutes with each tiny little piece of netting by the time it's prepared. So you can show that whenever you want, but all right. Yep. I'll walk you through it. Can you see that Pamela? Yeah. So okay. this, is, this is another piece that I did for the museum. It's called, this is pink. And that's my studio <laughs> filled with stuff. And this was actually from the Gulf of Maine lobster foundation, lots of net places. I sourced my net and it, to me, it resembles seaweed as well. These, um, so this is the net when I've cut it up and cut into smaller pieces. I never throw anything out. Um, then I get people to help me untwizzle. And everywhere I go, people are helping me unravel and unravel schools, elderly facilities. And then I have to dip it in paint. And then I have to hang each piece individually to dry. And then like that, it's actually very relaxing to do that. It's very meditative. And then once it's dry, um, it's all stuck together. So then I have to like pull each strand apart like that. And then it's ready to tie into the sculpture. There we go. So that's how that piece is made. There you go. That's really neat. It's just fantastic. I love your narration as well. <laughs> What I can do is I will put Pamela your website in the chat, um, and so she has so much amazing stuff to see. Um, Pamela Moulton, Moulton dot art dot art, and uh, there is a whole lot of other projects, not just of ghost gear, but a lot of other mediums that you are using of discarded items. Um, uh, one that really caught my eye was your using power outlets uh or like, like plugs um and and as well as discarded uh books um because of our use of more digital technology um it's kind of just really unique mediums uh 
uh, Pamela. So I don't know if you want to uh, share uh, about some of your other projects real quick, or um, but I'm I'm putting her website in the chat right now for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take up time if it's eight o'clock, but no, I'm I'm a material a material is a is a driving force for me. So depending on where I'm living and where um, what what's surrounding me, uh, the material sort of drives me. But like in Maine, it's just so. I spent a lot of time in Swans Island and I'm very familiar with the island communities. So, um, and I also am friends of the fishermen and I know how hard it is like this, what happens when your gear, when, when your gear is old and you can't use it anymore. And I know I, I took some to the recycling center and it was so expensive to recycle. I'm like, Oh my gosh, but, you know, so I would, it's, so it's really fun to travel to different communities and then work with the community saying, Hey, you know, I'll go to the school and we'll build a sculpture with the kids. And they're like, Oh my gosh, look what we can make with what we have on our Island. So, um, yeah, but I know I work with just, just anything I get my hands on, <laughs> but lately the, the ghost gear has been, I don't feel like I have a control of my destiny. I have too many commissions and projects with this material that I just keep moving forward. So, and I love it. So thank, thank you. Thanks, family. We can tell. I do have a quick, a couple quick questions for you since since you're talking right now. Um, oh. Where in Toronto is your sculpture being displayed? Because there's a couple, there's some people watching from Toronto, Toronto mm -hmm. right now. Yes. Well, the museum just opened this winter. It's the Arcadia Earth Museum, and uh, I totally recommend going. Yeah, and you can actually crawl inside my sculptures. They're all interactive. It's really fun. Wow. Um, and. Okay, great. And do you have to clean the ghost gear yourself? How intensive is the process, if so? Well, it's funny because sometimes it comes very clean to me. The sun, I think, is a great, is cleans it a lot. Like Laura's giving me some very clean net. Thank you, Laura. But I also have like been to fisheries and I get these big nets and I see them and they have them loaded on their trucks. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is what they're giving me. What am I going to do? And I get back to my studio and I can't even, it's so heavy. I can't even get it upstairs. And so my assistants and I are there cutting off pieces and it smells so bad and it's awful. And so the first thing I do, I remember it was, it was the winter time it, and I filled my pickup truck with as much as I could physically put in and I go to the car wash <laughs> and then I, car, and the people don't like me at all at the car wash, but I wash it, the net, and then I take it back to my studio and I hang it and the dirt falls off it. And then I take it again back to the car wash. So I probably wash it three times and then I let it sit outside and the sun um, helps to, because otherwise my studio smells terrible. So. <laughs> okay. I, I can also answer that question too, um, uh, regarding another artist that has worked with uh, the, go the ghost gear in particular. Um, and she got a uh, cow cleaning tub where you that you use to clean cows and you use a pressure washer with a lot of chemicals or something and she was basically doing a car wash in her backyard and other people do use pressure washers um you know hanging it out and then spraying it with a bleach or some sort of a, a peroxide type um you know mix so that um it can be so that that organic material can can then be fall off, fall off but it's tough to deal with when it's when it's bad like that <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Um, so there are uh, some questions coming in and I see that I, I think Laura and Julia, you're answering some of these as we go. So thank you so much for that. Um, so there's a question, what process is being made to convert the main fishermen to, to GPS to track their gear? If that's, um, uh, and I have, I think I've heard um, that there are some uh, uh, some attempts to, to do that. Um, and what else has been done to decrease the risk of whales, you know, whale entanglement um, in the gear, especially? I don't know who would be best to. Um, where is that question? Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, this question is targeted for Maine fishermen and we're the state of Massachusetts, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but our Massachusetts fishermen do have trackers on their vessels. Um, and, you know, they have done an exceptional job of putting, you know, weak rope into their lines and marking their gear. Um, Massachusetts is a different level tier of a fishery now um, for all the efforts that they've done to, you know, make their buoy lines whale safe and um, 
you know, we, we are now separated out from that in, in all of the progress that we've made since 2021. So um, as far as Maine goes, I can't speak to that, but um, yeah, Laura. Um, yeah, I work pretty closely with folks in Maine um, in the uh, state uh, department of Marine resources and recently have learned that they are um, they have a gear testing library or a gear library similar to what Massachusetts has access to so that fishermen are actually testing remotely operated fishing gear in Maine now. It is a very unpopular approach. There is not a lot of um, embracing of this uh, technology in the industry. However, uh, there are some forward thinking folks that are realize that there needs to be a few changes. And one of those changes may be a shift to remotely uh, deployed gear. In other words, um, gear that doesn't require an end line to get it out of the water. So it could be lifted by a flotation device or something like that. And that that is all in the testing phase. There is nobody um, actually using this gear to harvest lobsters currently. Yeah, and I will add that there's a we also have Eric here too, who can speak to a lot of what they're required to do um, as far as buoy line marking and things like that go. But as far as the on-demand gear goes, um, there's still a lot of testing that needs to be done with that. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainties with it. And, you know, they still have ropes on them. And so the it's up to the fishermen to be over the gear to press a button to release the rope to the surface to bring up the gear and you know with with mobile fishing um you know they can't see where that gear is and so it can create a lot of gear conflicts too so like laura said there's a lot of research that needs to be done before um that happens and it's extremely costly um to the point where it may put a fisherman out of business so that's primarily the reason for, you know, the opposition to it as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Eric has anything to add. Um, and if there's any further questions about, you know, Massachusetts gear removal efforts, uh, feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, I know we'll be wrapping up here shortly. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, Eric, feel free to chime in at any point regarding that. Well, I know with Massachusetts, we've we're we're applying for a uh, redu uh, a take reduction permit. It's called. So we had to come up with a ninety. We came up with like a ninety three or ninety percent uh, risk in uh, interaction or entanglement with a whale. There was recently a juvenile humpback that was witnessed to swim into a buoy line, and it was a uh, one of our newer modified weaker buoy lines, it swam into the buoy line and, you know, broke the buoy line loose and then swam away freely without any harm, injury, or re really like any sort of entanglement to kind of show that what we've done is working. So it was like a firsthand witness of a whale watch boat of this happening and the line doing what it was supposed to do. So that was kind of like on the brighter side for the industry of the, what we're doing here is helping. Uh, as far as, the acoustic buoys go it's not close to even being used yet my biggest concern being a fisherman is the price i've been told that these are four thousand to eight thousand dollars per buoy so if i wanted to participate in acoustic buoys it would cost me from three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars just in buoys to go do this so it kind of really scares a lot of the guys in the industry but we we're we're all making strides forward to try to get this done to you know make sure that we're not being detrimental to the right whale population and in, in my opinion we're we're all moving forward in the right direction some people want to speed it up and but you know we got to make sure that the fishermen can still go fishing and provide for their families absolutely thanks eric that's a great point um 
what what are some of the average things that the like there are some some things that the average beachgoer could do um in terms of when they see debris or uh you know anything along the lines of um if someone sees a large amount or you know what would be some recommendations that the average person could do when they go out and see some some of these things that we're worried about well it's a really tough nut to crack there there's no like one place to you know to, to make a phone call to um, I get a lot of phone calls. I think the coastal zone management office might be a good place to report, um, you know, egregious dumping or that type of thing. Um, and obviously, um, enforcement agencies uh, would want to know that. But for things that are just washing up on the shoreline as a result of, you know, circulation and coastal impacts, the storms that we've been having have been creating untold amounts of debris. Um, infrastructure debris is a huge issue, uh, especially right now uh, when we've been having these bizarre southerly storms um, that, that have been trashing shorelines that don't typically in the winter have to suffer these the direct hits. Um, the, the coast of Maine was ravaged with two storms last month. Um, the, the coast of um, Provincetown was too. Um, and I think that those are going to be some challenges that municipalities are going to have to grapple with on a much smaller scale. There's federal funding for this type of effort. Um, the, the grant that I received for this regional program is through the bipartisan infrastructure law. And the federal agencies have recognized that um, there are a lot of results of climate change impacts. When storms are bigger, the debris is bigger. And so the funding is there. And there are ways of securing that funding if you can design a plan. Um, it's, it's really a very unmanageable way of doing things things and prevention is always the better way to handle it, but it really, you, you are not going to be able to prevent our way out of this problem. Um, I, I really don't know that, um, you know, as an average beach goer, one of the things that I always encourage people to do is um, select a reporting app that works for you. Like a lot of people like to use their phones to record data. Um, and there are two that I recommend. One is the Clean Swell app. That's um, through the Ocean Conservancy. And another is called Marine Debris Tracker. And both of those are available for free. Um, the Marine Debris Tracker is through the uh, NOAA Marine Debris Program. And those allow you to, to feed that, the data that you secure into a federal database or a regional database or a bigger database. In fact, the, the Ocean Conservancy has a global database. Those are the types of data that really drive change. And that's where you're seeing some arguments about foam. I don't know if any of you have been paying attention to uh, the foam that um, is used to create uh, floats or docks or segments of, of piers and things like that. Um, that is a real problem. It's a, you know, it's an infrastructure problem because it's been used up and down the East Coast and it's really contributing to the foam debris in the ocean um, as storms and other events uh, take place and, and kind of damage the infrastructure. So there, there's a lot of data that can be um, then used by uh, folks that are you know, looking for those, those data points. So I was gonna take this opportunity um, to respond to another question um, about um, whether you can use AI to um, count your debris. And there are people who are working on that actually, uh, where a similar to like a, a materials recycling, a recovery facility, a MRF, where you just throw everything into one place um, and then little beams uh, shoot their lasers and, and can identify what things are. That's not, um, it's not commonplace. I think they've done some testing at MIT or possibly RISD. I can't remember, um, but it was somewhere in New England where they're looking at a conveyor belt of like assessing what trash is composed of. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty labor intensive process if you are trying to um, itemize those small items. Thanks, Laura. I, I noticed a question did come in right when I asked my last question um, it, uh, from someone who is a recreational fisherman as, as far as what they can do um, with ghost gear and are lead sinkers a problem as well? As far as I know, lead sinkers have been outlawed for, but maybe uh, that's from Maine. I don't really know what the law is about lead sinkers. So lead lead's a problem no matter what. If you lose lead, it's not good. Um, birds eat it. It's That's why it was banned, I believe, in inland fishing in Maine. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm kind of old, but as a kid, we were told never use a lead sinker um, because the loons were dying. Um, here in, you know, recreational fishing, 
um, as far as like hooking, you know, casting, there are ways to recycle the monofilament. We do find a monofilament all the time, you know, the te- the the whatever test that you might be using to catch stripers or whatnot. It's a real issue for entanglement for birds in particular, especially if there's a little piece of bait still on the hook and the hook gets hooked. Um, it's really a problem um, for bird entanglement and bird health, um, as well as other creatures, I'm sure. Um, recycling is um, something that is being done with monofilament, and there are very specific containers that can that collect monofilament at marinas. If you look around, they're sort of like candy cane shaped PVC pipes, and you can put your monofilament in there, and then um, that's the contain the collection point. Uh, usually sponsored by a local um, nonprofit or a scout group or something like that. And then all of the monofilament is then sent, I think, to Indiana, I believe, for recycling uh, because it is nylon. And so there are efforts to reduce the impacts of lost uh, clumps of monofilament. But that being said, we find it all the time in the the bass fishery, the striper fishery in in, um, certain parts of Massachusetts. It's pretty pretty, um, high impact for um, contributing to the debris that we find. So it's, um, it's something that we, we do track that as well, but you know, um, we also collect a lot of water bottles <laughs> and a lot of water bottle, uh, caps and so a lot of cigarette butts. So we're all part of the problem. <laughs> Luckily we're all part of the solution too. That's a good point. Um, uh, and thanks just like, uh, maybe just one or two more questions. Um, Pamela, this one's going back to you. Um, uh, can someone, someone that's interested in bringing a group of students to visit your studio, can they go about that? Well, at the moment, my studio is in Norway, Maine, and they, yeah, no, I welcome that, and I welcome, I never say no to volunteers, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you can contact me on my website. Yes. Emilamoten.art. Yeah, and there's and- a place to send me an email there. Great. Thanks, Pamela. Um and thanks, Laura for, and Julia, for filling some of these questions. Um, that I think I think some of the other questions you have already addressed or were addressed in the presentation. There's a lot of uh, comments saying "great presentation" and, and all that, and we really appreciate that. Um, so um, I think that's about it. Unless there's anything else that anyone wants to add, this is a really well-rounded presentation with a lot of great information here. Um, and so I really thank all of you for uh, the, the whole panel uh, for, for being here tonight and sharing uh, some of your wisdom with us. So um, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Julia. And thanks, Pamela. And thanks, Eric, as well. Um, this is really, it's like finding a balance between this incredibly important resource uh, with the environment as well as with the fisheries and the families that depend on this. So it's just, it's, it seems like just a tough balancing act that we're all really trying to figure out the best way to approach um, and taking care of what's important to us. So, um, so thanks all of you for, for joining. Um, um, when I, let me get a couple of things ready. Uh, what I can do is uh, actually, um, Kate, if, uh, uh, if you're here, I can share um a little bit uh of mass audubon's upcoming programs and then i can get my sponsorship list ready um so uh if you are here you should be able to see this i am here we're i am seeing the and oh there it is yeah so for those for those that are local um we have some really exciting upcoming programs that may appeal um just wanted to make a quick pitch for you know we'd love to see you come by the north river um, wildlife sanctuary for a visit. We've got some really fun things coming up at both the Tidmarsh, which is down in Plymouth in North River and Daniel Webster, which are in Marshfield. So just a quick plug for opportunities to come out to, um, again, be engaging of what's happening with birding and changing climate, understanding, you know, as things are changing, we, we got, we got all sorts of fun things. So love to talk more and Hope that we get to see some of you in person. I know we've got still another virtual event next week and then our in-person. So I can, you know, throw it back over to Brian for uh, for wrap up. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Th- 
Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, we uh, it's, this has been a, a great lineup of programs um, and uh, it's especially including tonight. And so um, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, Julia. And thanks, Eric, for for being here. Um, next week's program, our second to last one, it's the last Zoom and then we're back to in person. Um, but next week's program on February 28th is uh, the North and South River Marshes and the legacy of the 1898 Portland Gale. So uh, a major storm that changed the uh, the um, uh, inlet of the North and South Rivers dramatically. And so many residents of the North and South Rivers know that the Portland Gale of 1898 rearranged the estuary uh, when it cut the new inlet between Third and Fourth Cliff. And so it, um, what is less known is that the high tide levels in part of the North River rose about a foot and a half as the result of the shortened North River channel. Um, of course, because it cut the new inlet, which shortened the North River and extended the South River. So this abrupt increase in water levels represents a 120-year experiment in what happens to salt marshes when you raise water levels in some ways resembling rapid sea level rise. So Brian Yellen, a PhD candidate at UMass Amherst, will present work from several members of the Sediment and Coastal Dynamics Lab at UMass Amherst to unravel how and why the North and South River marshes respond to unintentional, to this unintentional experiment of um, uh, rising high tide levels. So uh, an incredibly interesting blend of history history and ecology as we look at our local rivers and how they're responding to sea level rise. Um, and then, of course, the last one uh, is a trivia night at Stellwagen Brewery, which we will incorporate uh, topics and questions from all the lectures during the series, as well as some general science and watershed information. So if you're interested in that, it is free. There is a separate um, registration link that we just ask you to fill out just so we know how many people are coming. Um, but of course, there will be beverages at Stellwagen, uh, and it should just be a fun trivia night. So you, everyone is welcome to, to attend that. Uh, and that is on that is on March sixth. So, with that, um, a, a brief, a just quick shout out to our sponsors, Clean Harbors, um, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Plymouth, and Duxbury. Thank you all so much for your support once again for educational programs like this. With that. We really appreciate you being here. We've had a record turnouts for every single. There was 101 people was the the high count for tonight. Um, so thanks all of you who have been participating week after week uh, and joining us. Uh, and then of course a huge shout out to Pamela, Laura, and Julia, and Eric uh, for presenting with us tonight. Um, and thanks, Kate, hey. with Mass Audubon as well. Uh, and so thank um, you, Brian. Thanks, Laura. Really appreciate. Uh, uh, tonight. This is fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'm Brian with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association and have a great night, everybody. We'll see you next week. Good night.